we'll move on to Sam. Um, Sam Sinyangwe is a data scientist who leads the development of research, digital tools, and platforms to end police violence and systemic racism in America. He has been named one of the Forbes 30 Under 30 and the Route 100. He has been involved in organizing and advocacy since he was in high school, previously working for PolicyLink and working with city leaders, youth activists, and community organizations to achieve quality education, health, and justice for young black men. He graduated from Stanford, Stanford University in 2012, where he studied how race and racism impact the US political system. So, take it away. Okay, um, so my story begins on August 9th, 2014. Uh, that's the day that Mike Brown Jr. was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri by the police. Now, you'll recall that his death became national news. Uh, it sparked a nationwide movement that really became a global movement uh, protesting racial injustice and specifically the injustice of police violence uh, in the United States and reverberating across the world. Um, in the year since his death, we saw four times as many protests within the United States as were seen during the height of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, a huge, major movement erupted, but in the early days and weeks and months of that movement, uh, there was a sincere question about data. And that's because the federal government, while we were seeing video after video after video of people being killed by the police, uh, the federal government in the United States still to this day does not collect comprehensive data on people killed by police. So the government could tell you how much rainfall there was in rural Missouri going back 100 years. Uh, they could not tell you how many people the police had killed last year or the year before. So my background is in data. I'm a data scientist. Uh, and I knew that having the numbers, having the data would be a powerful tool uh, to be able to inform people about this issue and then to drive uh, policy change to address it. And so I connected with activists on the ground in Ferguson through Twitter. Like I didn't know folks. Um, I was actually in Oakland at the time. I was a, a researcher working on issues of educational inequity. Um, but I connected online digitally to folks on the ground in Ferguson. Uh, and together we built the most comprehensive database on police violence in the country uh, called Mapping Police Violence. And we really launched with this map. Um, and it's a, it might be a little bit hard to see, but you can probably see the red pins. Uh, this is a map of the United States, uh, and the red pins are incidents of people killed by police in 2014. We were able, despite the federal government refusing and failing to do so, we were able through public records requests, through information that we were able to find online, on social media, through obituaries, through local media reports, uh, compiling all of this information in, co in collaboration with local organizations to produce uh, a comprehensive database of people killed by police. And what we found uh, was that there were 1,200 people killed by police that year. Not only that, but we had data, we were able to compile data going back to, tw to 2013, and now we have it going all the way through 2018. And what we found was that every single year the police were killing 1,200 people. Uh, and that's about three to four people every day. Uh, and we wanted to understand this issue a little bit better, to dive deeper into how police violence was impacting particular communities, uh, especially the communities that were taking to the streets to protest the injustice. Uh, we found that black people in America were three times more likely to be killed by police than white people, uh, that they were more likely to be unarmed. Uh, and interestingly, that the rates of police violence varied significantly depending on where you were. So in some cities, you had extraordinarily high rates of police violence. Uh, places like in St. Louis, where the protest started, uh, a black man in St. Louis is twice as likely to be killed by a police officer as the average American is to be killed by anyone, civilian or police, twice as high as the US murder rate. Uh, in Phoenix last year, one of the largest cities in the country, uh, one in every five homicides was committed by police. Uh, in Albuquerque, it was one in three. In Oklahoma City, it was one in six. In the city that I'm from, Orlando, Florida, had the second highest rate of police violence in the country. But what we also found was that there were cities that had lower rates, uh, cities where things were happening differently in terms of how police were interacting with communities. Uh, places like Irvine, California, which was the only city of the 100 largest cities in the country where police had not killed anyone from 2013 through 18. Uh, cities like Buffalo, New York, uh, which had similar demographics as Orlando, Florida, and some of the cities that I mentioned, um, similar crime rates, but had much lower rates of police violence. Um, so we wanted to understand, now that we had the data to map this across the country, we could start asking di different questions about why 
some of the places that I mentioned earlier had such high rates of police violence, what was going on in those places, and what was happening that was going right uh, in some of the cities that I mentioned. And so we collaborated with local organizations across the country to obtain the policy documents of those police departments. We wanted to understand every single factor that was at play contributing to these rates of police violence, whether it was the use of force policies of the police departments. Uh, these are the policies that determine how and when local police departments are authorized to use force. So unlike in many countries in Europe where there is a single standard uh, governing police use of force, in the United States, there's not a federal standard. Uh, each state has its own standard. Uh, some states actually have not adopted a state law establishing a standard on when police can use force, including deadly force. Uh, so city by city, you could have completely different rules on how and when police could use force. Uh, so we investigated that. For the 100 largest cities in the country, we obtained the use of force documents of those police departments. Uh, and in looking through those documents, what we found was that the rules were so different, and not only that, but the rules mattered in explaining how likely it was that police would actually kill somebody. So, just a couple of more statistics about this issue, um, because we won't often talk about accountability. So, not only were we finding that so many people were being killed by police, but we were also finding um, that when police officers killed somebody in the United States, it was exceedingly rare for those officers to be held accountable by the criminal justice system. Um, so, in 97% of all cases where a police officer kills somebody, they are not charged with any crime. Uh, in 99% of cases, they're not convicted of a crime. And when they are convicted of a crime, they receive a lesser sentence than a civilian convicted of the exact same crime. So there's a case in Georgia, for example, where a police officer killed an unarmed black man. And for the first time in that state's history, the judge allowed somebody to serve a part-time jail sentence, uh, specifically mentioning that because he was a police officer, he only had to serve jail time during the weekends. So these are some of the rates that I talked about of police violence, right? So you can see different cities, St. Louis and Orlando and Oklahoma City at the top with the highest rates of police violence, but also some of the cities that have lower rates. And then what you can also see to, to your right, uh, this is a chart visualizing uh, unarmed people killed by police uh, in major American cities from during this time frame, 2013 through 18. Uh, and what you can see here, it's color-coded by race. Um, so the red squares are unarmed black people killed by police, the orange squares are unarmed Latinos killed by police, and the gray uh, squares are unarmed white people killed by police. Um, so what you can see here quite clearly is that almost every unarmed person killed by a police officer in major American cities is a person of color, the majority of whom are black. That's who's impacted by this issue. Um, so wanted to also use the data to unpack and debunk some of the narratives that have allowed police violence to continue unabated for so many years. I mentioned that you know, 1,200 people were killed by police in 2014. That's the same for 2015 and 2016 and 2017 and 2018. It's also the same for 2013 before the movement began and before there was so much national attention in this, on this issue. And one of the narratives that has sought to justify police violence is a narrative about crime, a narrative that, that goes something like this that police officers are using deadly force, particularly in black communities, because they're encountering violent criminals and having to defend themselves using any means possible from harm. That's the narrative that you hear. You turn on you know, conservative media in the United States, that's what you hear. Now, that narrative isn't supported by the facts. Uh, and the police up until recently haven't had to actually defend that narrative because the data hadn't been collected to disprove it. Um, but we collected the data and we tested the narrative uh, and what you see is it doesn't bear out. So the red squares here are rates of police violence for the 60 largest cities uh, in the country and the uh, blue X's are the violent crime rates. Um, so what you see here is quite clearly that the violent crime rates are not correlated with the rates of police violence. There are cities with very high violent crime rates that have relatively low rates of police violence. There are cities with high rates of police violence that have relatively low rates of violent crime. So something else is explaining why the police are using this level of force in particular places. And as I said earlier, a lot of that has to do with the policies and practices of those police departments. And so in obtaining all of these policy documents, the use of force policies, uh, the policies on training, uh, information about the oversight structures that are investigating misconduct within those departments, uh, information on police militarization, how many military weapons, assault weapons, tanks, are police departments receiving from the Department of Defense? Uh, by the way, in the US under the 1033 program, a police department can apply to receive these types of weapons, including uh, military aircraft, uh, grenade launchers, uh, tanks, uh, assault weapons, 
free of charge. All they have to pay is shipping and handling uh, to have this shipped from the military uh, to the police department to use in any way that they see fit. Uh, and in doing that, I'll give you an example of how we evaluated uh, these policies and connected them uh, to this issue. So use of force policies. As I said, each police department has its own use of force policy. This is designed and developed locally. Um, in, and it's informed often by state law, but it goes above and beyond state law in many cases. Um, so when we looked through these policies, what we saw was that the language was, was, was very different, depending on where you were. Uh, and so here are two examples. This is San Jose in California. It's a city of about a million people. This is their use of force policy. I'm just going to read it word for word. Uh, officers need not retreat or desist in the reasonable use of force. There is no requirement that officers use a lesser intrusive force option before progressing to a more intrusive one. That's the policy. So compare that with Philadelphia. It is important for first responding officers to use caution, evaluate the situation, attempt to de-escalate the situation through communication, request a crisis intervention team trained officer, that's an officer trained in how to interact with folks who are in a mental health crisis, um, if not personally trained, wait for backup and await the arrival of a patrol supervisor before taking any action barring a threat to life. Retreating or repositioning is not a sign of weakness or cowardice by an officer. It is often a tactically superior police procedure rather than the immediate use of force. Only the minimal amount of force necessary to protect life or effect an arrest should be used by an officer. And then finally, at the end, the policy on deadly force, the application of deadly force is a measure to be employed only in the most extreme circumstances after all lesser means of force have failed or could not reasonably be employed. This is the opposite policy, right? So we go back to San Jose. Officers need not retreat, need not, not, need not desist, no requirement to use a lesser intrusive force option before progressing to a more intrusive force option. But in Philadelphia, they are very much required to do so. So the question is, how much does this actually matter? I mean, these are words on a piece of paper. How do they influence police officers' behaviors on the street? So in comparing the rates of deadly force that I showed you uh, in each city to the types of restrictions in their use of force policies. So this is a grid mapping eight different types of restrictions that we found in those policies. So for example, does the policy require officers to use de-escalation? Does the policy ban chokeholds and strangle holds? Does it require officers to give a verbal warning before shooting somebody? Does it ban officers from shooting at moving vehicles, a practice that even the uh, Department of Justice, even police organizations say is exceedingly dangerous and unhelpful because it off if you hit the driver, the car then becomes uh, unguided and can run into a crowd? Uh, does it require officers to intervene and stop another officer if they witness them using excessive force? Does it require officers to exhaust all other means before using deadly force, right, like I showed you in Philadelphia? Well, it turns out most police departments didn't have the majority of these. So the average was three of these eight restrictions uh, among police departments, among the 100 largest departments in the country. Uh, and even for common sense things like requiring de-escalation whenever possible, only about 40% of police departments have that policy, um, requiring officers to, uh, limiting deadly force to be a last resort after other options are used, um, that only about 40% of police departments have that as a policy. Um, well, it turns out all of those policies predicted significantly lower rates of deadly force. So much so that those departments that required de-escalation were 15% less likely to kill people. Departments that required officers to exhaust all other means before using deadly force were 25% less likely to kill people. And the, com the combination of these policies being put in place uh, actually produced the largest reductions in police violence. So moving from zero of these policies to adopting all eight um, statistically, that was associated with a 72% reduction in killings by police. This is huge. Um, and as I said, few departments had these in place. Only one department, San Francisco, has all eight of these policies in place. So that's using the data to identify solutions, identify policies that have a base of evidence of being effective in a space that lacked all of this. I mean, we're talking about a field of criminology that was spending billions of dollars. You had almost every academic institution had a, had a criminology department where folks were, were learning essentially how to use police as a strategy to address crime. Now, 
First of all, policing is not the most effective approach to crime. Um, if you look at the research literature, it's investments in communities. Uh, it is community-based approaches that uh, involve community-based organizations, community-based first responders, conflict de-escalators, mental health responders, um, investing in uh, substance abuse prevention and, and mental health treatment um, that are most effective at addressing crime. But forget all of that. The reality is they weren't investing any money in how to actually stop police from committing crimes of how to stop police from engaging and participating in the violence. Um, and so that's the research that we've been doing. Now, taking that research, visualizing it, uh, understanding what are the components that predict police violence, and also what are the components that can help hold officers accountable to enforcing these standards. So it's one thing to adopt stronger use of force policies. Um, it's another thing to make sure that they are actually enforced by police departments. Um, to enforce them, it requires dealing with a whole host of additional systemic issues. So part of this investigation was uncovering things that were often hiding in plain sight. Things like police union contracts, which you know, don't sound sexy, they don't sound like, uh, you know, when we talk about police violence in the United States, we're often talking about training, we're talking about investments in police departments, we're talking about use of force, we're talking about body cameras. We're not talking about police union contracts, but it turns out when we look through those contracts, there were a host of things in those contracts that had been negotiated over the years that had made it exceedingly difficult to actually discipline a police officer for misconduct. So for example, in Cleveland, where the police killed Tamir Rice, um, they have a provision in their contract that requires all records of police discipline to be destroyed after two years. So you think about you know, a police officer with a record of misconduct, and what we know when we look at the data is that there are often a smaller number of police officers, uh, like was mentioned, um, that are responsible for, a, for huge and egregious acts of misconduct that are repeated over the years. So in Columbus, Ohio, for example, 6% of the police officers on the force were responsible for half of all use of force incidents. 6% of the officers, half of use of force incidents. But because of these provisions in the contract, they were actually purging those records systematically, so we couldn't figure out who those officers were. Not only that, but in cases where you were able to figure out which officers they were, you did discipline them, you did fire them, in the contract, they had clauses that allowed those officers to get their job back, plus back pay, by appealing through arbitration, where essentially they could select a lawyer to review the case that had full power to reinstate them regardless of what the city decides. Um, so in places like San Antonio, Texas, 70% of all officers who are fired end up getting their jobs back through that single provision in the contract. So that's the system. You know, we had to investigate and, and unpack the elements of the system that were creating and perpetuating this crisis year over year over year at the same rates. So how do we actually address this? Now that we understand the problem, we're starting to understand the components of it and the solutions in terms of policy and practice. How do we adopt those in a, in a context and in a country where there are 18,000 different police departments, each with their own leadership, each with their own policies and practices, each with their own culture and funding sources? Well, to do that, it, it's bigger than any one organization or collaborative. I mean, we've been in rooms with you know, the president, with presidential candidates, we've been in rooms with state and local leaders, um, but we can't be in every room, nor should we be. The way that you're able to address this issue is by digitally being able to make this information so accessible that any community, any person can find this information on their own, can evaluate their own police department, can access the data and the policy information that they need to walk into those rooms with their mayor, with their city council member, with their state legislator, and be just as effective in pushing for policy change as any one of us. And so that's the work that we sought to do. So for example, one way that we were able to do this was by launching a digital survey on Twitter. Um, so, so much of, of what I've showed you, we've actually used Twitter as the way to communicate it, um, it as a strategy of, of getting around many of the institutions that have often sought to block or delay or slow or not fund the work that needed to get done. So by launching the survey on Twitter, um, it asked people very simple questions. Uh, people who wanted to get involved in uh, doing the work to address police violence were asked how many uh, hours a week they had to contribute, uh, what types of work they wanted to do, so did they want to help collect data, did they want to review policy, uh, did they want to engage in protest, did they want to track legislation, did they want to meet with legislators, um, and then they were asked, you know, what type of background do you have in this work? You know, so we had data scientists who signed up, we had designers and developers, we had everyday folks, right, folks who were cashiers, um, folks who had never done this work before, who wanted to get involved in this, and we trained them in how to do this. 
Um, and in launching the survey, we signed up 18,000 people in two weeks across the country. Um, and those were the people who helped review all of the policies that I showed you. Those were the people who designed and developed and, and published the, the data visualizations that I showed you. Um, those were the people that have sat in city hall meetings and in meetings with mayors and legislators across the country to push for policy change. So by creating a system where we, created, where we made this as accessible as possible, uh, we were able to achieve uh, a, a reality where we, where we could see policy change in multiple jurisdictions simultaneously with virtually no resources. And we've seen policy change. So we track legislation in every state and in the largest cities in the country. Um, since 2014, there have been 40 states that have signed legislation to do something to address police violence. Now, this looks great. It's not wonderful because oftentimes, you know, as, as, as I've said, there are many aspects to this. It requires doing more than just changing the use of force policy. You have to make sure you're adopting accountability structures to enforce those policies. It means more than doing training, um, but you're also making sure that the officers in those trainings who don't perform are held accountable. Um, but nevertheless, this is a substantial increase from the period before 2014. Uh, in, before 2014, every single year, we saw maybe one or two states do something about police violence. Since then, we've seen the majority of states take action. And in some states, they have taken comprehensive action. In places like Illinois, they've changed the state's deadly force standard. They've banned chokeholds. They have adopted a police misconduct database. Uh, in places like uh, New Jersey, they've launched a nationwide or a statewide police misconduct database. Uh, and they have also created a, 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 a a mechanism for officers who have committed misconduct not to be rehired. Um, same thing in Connecticut. We've seen independent investigations and prosecutions uh, laws passed in places like Texas, um, in places like uh, New Jersey, uh, in places like Connecticut and New York. So progress is being made. But we're just at the beginning. So when we see communities that have changed laws to address police violence, um, now we're able to track the results of that. Because we can track the data over time in terms of people who've been shot by police, people who've been killed by police, those places that have adopted new use of force policies, uh, that have passed legislation, have significantly fewer police shootings today than they had before. Those are lives saved. So the challenge is less so figuring out what to do. It's about how do we scale what's working to every single one of the 18,000 police jurisdictions in the United States. Uh, to do that requires a distributed organizing methodology. It requires the ability to visualize and tell stories that empower everyday people to walk into those, those you know, chambers of state legislatures, to walk into those city councils uh, and be just as effective in advocating for these types of changes as any one of us could be. Um, and we're seeing that work city by city, state by state. But again, there are 104 million Americans, according to Pew Research Survey, who currently support the Black Lives Matter movement, 104 million Americans. You'll recall that Donald Trump got, I think, 60 million votes. Hillary Clinton got 63 million votes. Uh, and yet, 104 million people. And we've, at best, only scratched the surface, only scratched a fraction of that number and involved them in this work. And yet, yet and still, we're able to see results. So the question and the challenge for all of us, not only in the United States, but across the world, is how do we design through technology, through our storytelling, through our journalism and investigations, how do we design those with an in intent to make them accessible to as many people as possible so that we can reach this scale, not only on police violence and criminal justice reform, but this is an issue that is in common with so many issues. You look at climate change. How many billions of people across the world care about climate change and are affected by it, and yet, how many people are actively engaged in the work? Well, luckily today we've had 100,000 people in this city alone engaged in it, um, but that's the key. How do we keep involving more and more people, not only in the streets protesting, but engaged in the policy work, engaged in the research, engaged in holding legislators accountable in every single district across the country and across the world? That's the work that we have to do. And I think we've only just scratched the surface on what's, what's achievable. So thank you.